On this week's special edition of Auto Mundial, we're taking a look back at some of our favorite new cars from 2021. Despite the ongoing effects of the pandemic and a worldwide shortage of semiconductors, 2021 has been a great year for cars. SUVs have continued to spring up from all corners of the car building world, while yet more automotive niches have been filled with coupe crossovers and the return of mini trucks. And while new EVs have continued to wow us with their new tech and increasingly impressive ranges, internal combustion hasn't had a bad year either. One of our favorites that we first featured in January was this, the superb Toyota GR Yaris. It's caused the pulses of petrol heads all over the world to race with its all-wheel drive, limited slip differentials and real rally pedigree. This is what's known as a homologation car, basically a vehicle produced so Toyota could take it rallying in the WRC. Sadly though, following the COVID-19 pandemic, the rules were changed and the rally car project was scrapped. Thankfully, however, this road version wasn't. Following on from the old Imprezas, Evos and Celicas, it's the first true rally car for the road in a generation. And as such, expectations are high. And immediately, you can tell this little ankle biter means business. With a whole new body, it's completely different from the regular Yaris, with a squat, purposeful stance and lots of sporty details, like the forged alloy wheels, the twin exhausts, and plenty of GR badges dotted around. Powering this pint-sized three-door grunt nugget is a turbocharged 1.6-litre three-cylinder motor. That might not sound like much, but it puts out a healthy 257 bhp and powers the Yaris from 0 to 62 miles per hour in just five and a half seconds. That big lump of power is sent through a six-speed manual gearbox to an adaptive all-wheel drive system and, if you spec the circuit pack, two limited slip diffs. Torque is automatically split between the two axles, each one capable of receiving all of the power if required. Inside, the cabin is a little less exotic and a lot more regular Toyota. It feels nice and solid, with a great three-spoke steering wheel and a chunky gear stick. So, it's a real throwback to some of the most exciting Japanese cars of the 90s. It isn't even too expensive, with prices starting at just under £30,000 for the standard car, rising to £33,500 for the circuit pack version. And the Yaris wasn't the only rally car for the road we saw this year. In 1968, the Ford Motor Company launched a new model to replace the humble Anglia. Featuring American-influenced Coke bottle styling, the Escort was also developed for motorsport use, and in particular, rallying. Cars and competitors were to visit 25 countries in just 26 days driving. Their ultimate destination, Mexico City. Throughout the 1970s, the Escort, with its Cosworth-derived BDA engine, dominated the world of rallying. The Mark II model won the inaugural 1979 World Rally Championship and again in 1981. Fast forward to 2021, 43 years after the first Escort drove off the production line. And guess what? Yep, we can go back to the future. Because believe it or not, British company MST Cars has started remanufacturing both the Mark I and Mark II models at their workshop in deepest, darkest Wales. Make no mistake, these are not rebuilt kit cars. These are brand new registered vehicles built from the ground up. Customers can spec their car to preference and price accordingly with a choice of both engine and trim options. Built to order from basic road trim up to full rally spec, both the Mark I and Mark II models really are a blank canvas. Popular power plant options range from classic Crossflow and Pinto variants right up to Cosworth and Millington 16-valve units. 
producing eye-watering power outputs, in some cases in excess of 300 horsepower. With incredible power-to-weight ratios and rear-wheel drive, each car is tailor-made for fun. Sequential gearboxes, power steering and huge LSD axles are all on the options list too. So whether you want a new classic for Sunday afternoons or a fully blown rally car, MST can build your dream classic. Elsewhere in the British sports car industry, Lotus announced it would be ending production of the Elise after 25 years on sale. So how do you replace such an icon? Well, with this, the Amira, Lotus's last ever combustion-powered car. A beautiful thing, we're sure you'll agree, the Amira is the Norfolk-based brand's first entirely new production car in over a decade, but it still carries some familiar features. The wonderful styling has been influenced by the Avaya, an electric hypercar in its final stages of development, while the supercharged Toyota V6 from the Avora and Exige remains. However, the 3.5-litre V6 is not the only engine option. While all first edition models will be equipped with the familiar Toyota engine, pumping out something in the region of 400 horsepower when it arrives in dealerships in spring next year, later versions will also be available with a turbocharged 2-litre engine from AMG. It's been a big year on the other side of the pond too, with numerous big releases. Perhaps our favourite though wasn't actually very big at all. For years now, the smallest Ford truck you could buy has been the Ranger. Capable and affordable, and more compact than the F-150, it's always been a strong seller for them, even in Europe. Now though, Ford is entering into a new section of the market with this, the all-new Maverick. Built on the same platform as the new Bronco Sport, the Maverick will be the brand's cheapest truck and by some margin. Prices start at just over 21,500 US dollars. That's cheap for a hatchback, never mind a pickup truck. So what do you get for your 21,500 dollars? Well, if we're honest, not a great deal. All trim levels will come as standard with a 2.5 litre four-cylinder petrol engine hooked up to a hybrid system for about 190 brake horsepower. Entry-level Mavericks though are only available with front-wheel drive so don't expect it to keep up with a Ranger on the trails. Step up to the XLT and top-of-the-range Lariat trim levels and things get better. Even the high-spec cars are very well priced with the Lariat starting at under 27,000. Four-wheel drive is optional, but only if you upgrade to the smaller but more powerful 250 horsepower 2-litre. The $24,000 mid-range XLT seems like the best option to us. It's still basic, but it adds some nice creature comforts like cruise control, electric mirrors and a power-locking tailgate. There are loads of option packs too if you fancy things like dual-zone climate control and electric seats. However, Ford is not alone in the return of the mini truck market. Hyundai has had a go too, with this, the Santa Cruz. Like the Maverick, it has SUV underpinnings and pairs them with a truck bed and cool styling. But while the Ford is targeted at young buyers and commercial buyers, the Hyundai seems a bit more consumer friendly. It's loaded with tech and gets a real premium interior. It looks more like an SUV too, although both these trucks look fantastic in their own ways. There are two powertrain options for the Santa Cruz, both meaty 2.5 litre four cylinders. The first produces 190 horsepower with the upgraded turbocharged 2.5, putting out 275. 
Both are hooked up to an 8-speed automatic transmission, with the higher spec model getting a dual clutch. Both versions get all-wheel drive and locking differentials, meaning it should hold its own over rougher terrain. Prices for the Hyundai have not yet been announced, but we expect them to be a fair bit higher than the Ford. The Ford Maverick then, while basic, looks to be another pickup truck success for Ford. The F-150 is America's best-selling vehicle, so we imagine the Maverick will do well too. Sadly though, like the Hyundai, it isn't coming to Europe. Join us again after the break as we continue our rundown of our favourite cars of 2021. Welcome back to part two of our look back at 2021's best new cars. And we start, weirdly, with a car from last year, the Land Rover Defender. For 2021, though, there's a new version for the lineup. And it has something we haven't seen in a series production Defender since the early 90s, a V8. Oh yes, Land Rover engineers have been busy raiding the JLR parts bin and pulled out the brand's perennial supercharged 5-litre V8, normally found in F-types and Range Rover Sports. It's something enthusiasts have been hoping for for years, but it does come at a cost. Prices start at more than £100,000 and that's Mercedes G-Wagon territory. Still, you are getting the fastest production Defender ever for your money. With 518 brake horsepower, the short wheelbase 90 can hit 62 miles per hour from rest in 5.2 seconds, on its way up to a top speed of 149. The five-door 110 isn't far behind, adding a couple of tenths to the 0-60 sprint. Obviously, you can't just whack a big V8 in an off-roader and call it a day, so the engineers have been busy tweaking the Defender's chassis so it can handle all that power. There are new springs and dampers all around, and thicker anti-roll bars for good measure. There's a new dynamic mode in the car's terrain response system, and there's a specially calibrated gearbox and electronically controlled rear diff. Naturally, Land Rover has made sure that passers-by can pick it out from a crowd. There are some subtle V8 badges on the car's flanks, as well as some meaty 22-inch alloy wheels and four aggressive-looking tailpipes to pump out that V8 roar. Inside, there's some special leather trim, V8-branded tread plates and chrome gear shift paddles. It may be hard to describe a six-figure Land Rover Defender as good value, but there's no denying that this is one of the most desirable and fun SUVs money can buy. If big V8 SUVs aren't your thing though, we've seen some wonderful electric cars this year, our favourite being this, the Hyundai Ioniq 5. Every side is covered in sharp creases and angles that set it apart from just about everything else on the roads. The design language was inspired by a concept car from 1974 called the Hyundai Pony Coupe, with various flat surfaces and lots of glass. There are nice touches like the clamshell bonnet and flush door handles, and some beautiful slim LED headlights tucked away in the front fascia. In the cabin, things are a little more conventional, but still ultra stylish. The floor-mounted batteries and lack of engine have resulted in a spacious, airy interior that looks as if it could have come from a high-end office furniture shop. A pair of big screens top off the modern cabin, while the reclining seats look perfect for napping in while you wait for your car to charge. Speaking of charging, 
The Ionic 5 is capable of super fast charging, something usually reserved for Porsche Taycans and Teslas, meaning it can go from 10 to 80% in 17 minutes with a 350 kilowatt hour charger. Two different battery packs are on offer, three power outputs and rear or all-wheel drive. In the most affordable configuration, it produces 168 brake horsepower and will hit 62 miles per hour from rest in 8.5 seconds and achieve 240 miles on a single charge. Top spec cars get a power boost to 215 brake horsepower and can do 0 to 62 in 7.4 seconds. The range is improved too, up to 300 miles. While electric cars have been with us for a while now, few have really felt like true sports cars. Sure, there are plenty of fast EVs out there that will pin you to the back of your seat, but generally speaking, the weight of all those batteries has meant they never really feel quite as impressive in the corners. So when Porsche revealed the Taycan in 2019, it seemed like a breath of fresh air. Finally, petrol heads could start to get excited about EVs, and now the Taycan has a sister car. Meet the Audi e-tron GT, an all-electric four-door saloon based on the Taycan's architecture. A rival to the likes of the Tesla Model S and Mercedes EQS, it's a big luxury saloon with impressive range and even better performance. Prices start at a smidge over £81,000, and for that you get a 298-mile range and two electric motors sending 469 brake horsepower to all four wheels. 0-62 miles per hour is dealt with in 4.1 seconds with a top speed of 152. From a styling perspective, the Taycan underpinnings are clear. The Ingolstadt designers have done a good job of making it look like an Audi, but the Porsche's footprint remains. In fact, the e-tron GT shares 40% of its parts with the Taycan. The e-tron, though, is set up a little differently. Where the Porsche is tuned predominantly for performance and driving pleasure, the Audi is softer and more comfortable for those who want a big, comfy wafter that, every now and again, can adjust the positions of your internal organs when you put your foot down. The cabin is as beautifully trimmed as you'd expect from an 80 grand Audi. It isn't quite as ultra-modern as the exterior, but it isn't at all disappointing. Naturally, it gets some big screens with a virtual cockpit display in front of the driver and a 10-inch infotainment screen in the middle of the dash. There's no third screen for the climate control and aircon, instead just some good old-fashioned easy-to-use buttons. Being an electric car, the e-tron GT has one eye on the environment. It's available with a variety of vegan upholsteries and ethically sourced recycled wood trims. This though isn't the only version of Audi's electric four-door. This is the Audi RS e-tron GT and, as the name suggests, it's a harder, faster and altogether more exciting car. Like the regular GT, the RS has two electric motors, one at the front and one at the back. Here though, they are tuned to produce a combined output of 590 brake horsepower. The front motor drives a single gear transmission, while the more powerful rear motor drives a twin-speed gearbox with an electronic differential to keep all that power in check. However, this being an electric car, it is on the heavy side. 
It may only be about the size of an A6, but it weighs a remarkable 2,347 kilograms. Nevertheless, the RS e-tron will still sprint from 0 to 62 miles per hour in 3.6 seconds. And you can even get that down to 3.3 if you select the dynamic mode to activate the overboost function. This extra performance does come at a price though. Prices for the RS start at £112,000 and it isn't just your wallet that will take a hit. The range is down versus the standard car as well, although only by 16 miles or so. That sort of money puts it in the same sort of big money price range as the faster, prettier and arguably more desirable Porsche Taycan Turbo. We like the Audi e-tron GT, but we can't help but think it will always sit in the shadow of a Stuttgart sibling. Join us again next week as we continue our look back at some of the best new cars from the last 12 months.